Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Rochelle. How are you? I am well, thank you. thank you. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this chat with me. May I ask you please to tell us your name? Kristen Hess. Excellent. And may you share a little bit about yourself so we can get to know you a little bit better? Sure. I um, uh, live in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm a architect and I'm the CEO of HH Architecture, a firm that I founded 15 years ago. Excellent. So, so uh, you know, remarkably, this is the second architect in two weeks. I'm just shocked by this, <laughs> you know. Wow. So, um, you know, when when Georgie reached out to me to uh, to chat with me, I was like, okay, I don't know anything about architecture other than the basics, you know. So, let me start by asking you, why did you decide to start your own architecture firm, and what have been the results of doing so? Well, I think I knew I wanted to be, uh, to own up my, uh, my own firm before I knew I wanted to be an architect, honestly. Um, I had a, I ran little businesses as a kid <laughs> and um, I had a library. I made my friends check out books and um, charge them fines, which may not be good to admit, but anyway. <laughs> Um, so I knew I wanted to have my business when I figured out that I did want to be an architect, which was in late in high school, I knew that someday I'd have my own firm just because I loved the idea of it. Um, and I worked for a wonderful company for eight years out of college and, uh, they were a great place to grow up and, and learn so much about the profession, but there wasn't really going to be a place to be an owner there. You know, the folks that were just becoming owners had been waiting for a really long time. And so um, I had a new baby, maybe not the best time, but I decided to strike out on my own. So, and at the time I had a business partner uh, and he, he joined with me, but then I bought him out after a couple of years. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And so has your business been in Raleigh all the time? So is Raleigh your home base? Raleigh is my home base. I came to Raleigh to go to NC State and I stayed. And so do you build and construct and design homes in Raleigh or do you do it across the nation? I only work in North Carolina. I'm currently only licensed in North Carolina and Virginia, but Virginia is brand new. I haven't really, I just got my license in Virginia and I actually don't do homes. I only do commercial buildings. Excellent. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we work all over the state of North Carolina right now. Excellent. I hope you will connect with Georgie. I sent it to, yeah, she does, she does basically the same thing you described. I do think she does do some residential, but most of her work is for the federal government. So I hope you two will connect. You know. We did connect already on LinkedIn and we've exchanged uh, emails and we're going to find a time to chat just like this. So I'm really excited for the introduction. Thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. So um, let me just ask you this. So how hard is it to be a female and a sole owner female in architecture uh, in, in North Carolina, but just generally, how hard has it been as a woman to, to, to grow your career? Well, you know, um, I don't know that I know any different. <laughs> it's definitely a male dominated profession. Uh, I say architecture is old, male and white. Um, and so, sorry, shh, my dog is whining right here. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> professional well, is, she wants to talk to. She does. She <laughs> would like you to ask her a question or give her a treat. Um, yeah. but the profession is, is very old, very male and very white. And it's, it's a struggle in that regard because there's nobody to look to, or there's not been historically very many people to look to. Some people have heard me share that when I, um, declared in high school to my guidance counselor that I wanted to apply to the NC State School of Design. She said, it's too hard. You won't get in. Don't even, don't even apply. And I did anyway, of course, and I got in, thank goodness. But I thought about what if that had, I hadn't listened, I had listened to her. That was very discouraging. And then also uh, my principal of my high school, and this was 1992. So, you know, it feels like not that long ago said, you know, architecture is for men. That's a man's field. And I think it's going to be a struggle and you should really consider something else. So two really big blows. Fortunately, I had an awesome, you know, support system at home. But I think about that all the time. Um, for people that are supposed to be encouraging you and helping you spread your wings and instead telling you no, you know, that's too hard. Um, that was discouraging. And then um, how hard is it now? Well, I've been doing it, you know, been doing the 
the job for over 20 years and I really don't let it bother me now. But in the beginning, I was really nervous. I cut my hair really short and I wore men's clothes and I wanted to look really, <laughs> really businessy. I had a holster on my, my khaki pants for my cell phone. My husband was like, oh my gosh, what has happened to you? Because I had long hair and flowy skirts and Birkenstocks in college, you know, so, um, but I just, I wanted to be taken seriously and I was so scared that I wouldn't be. But you know, I never had trouble with contractors. They've always been respectful. It's always, um, not if, if it's gonna be anybody, and it's not always, but if it's gonna be anybody, it's an owner and it's usually a power trip. You know, it's somebody that's got an ax to grind or somebody that feels threatened in general. Uh, and I never knew if it was because I was young or a woman. And I've talked to a lot of friends who are black. They say, I don't know if it's because I'm young or black or a woman <laughs> or all of the above. Uh, but anyway, um, you, you definitely are still the only woman in the room most of the time. And that's unfortunate, but that's, you know, still the case. I find myself in that position a lot. And so just have to be really, um, you have to lean in like, you know, we've, we've read about, you have to make a place for yourself. And I've had to learn to set boundaries, you know, people asking me, oh, can I have a copy of your notes? And it's like, well, I didn't take these notes for you. These, <laughs> Kristen's a good note taker. She was taking the notes. Yeah. You know, well, I was taking those notes for me, not as your secretary. Absolutely. So, Always you know, little tough. things, yeah. but nothing. I mean, I had one major, major, when I was young, I had one major, major uh, scare with somebody who was really inappropriate. And I had fortunately some women mentors who said, you tell that guy to knock it off. Yeah. Um, but, but I was too, I was really scared. I mean, I didn't believe that I had the ability to say that. And they said, you're a human being, you say it. So anyway, and now I should qualify that I'm not a sole owner anymore. So just a couple of years ago, I actually asked two people to join me in partnership. And so now I do have some owner, uh, some partners. I was on my own for a long time and I am actually getting ready to uh, hope to bring on some more partners. So I'm excited about that uh, in the future, trying to grow from within. Excellent, I hope you will hire a, a, a interior designer in residence. I know a perfect one for you. Well, I would love to. I have three interior designers actually oh, already. Wonderful, that's Yeah, great. so I, I did, um, I saw uh, your daughter Shell on the, she does, does she go by Shell? No, her name is D Shell. Like, so D mine Shell. is Ro and she's D. D. Uh, I reached out to D Shell on LinkedIn, but she's got a special, she's got a special, I'm not sure how to work her LinkedIn. I have to have it be a premium member or something like that. So I emailed her. And so we'll, we'll chat that way. Excellent. I appreciate that very much. I just think of she course. keeps an asset. I think she's getting ready to do a very large job, uh, commercial job in Washington, DC coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, she just helped somebody build a bed and breakfast or what do you call those things? Um, Airbnb or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yep. she, she's really, really good. And I'm always trying to make sure I do advocate for her as I should. Of course um, you should. Is she going to move back to the Triangle region? Do you know? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, you know, she came home, um, you know, when, when um, I think she's been home three years now. She came back here uh, three years ago, but she kind of comes and goes. So she, I never know where she is. So, you know, she's been all over the world doing her work. So, you know, I think this is probably her home base, but probably not for long. Yeah, understood. Understood. Oh, she, she's going. She's going places. She's going places, and she won't take me with her. But of course, yeah, I don't want to go with her. So, so I, I want to go back to your discussion earlier, and, and and just note something. So, you're the only one in the room. You know, you learn to uh, navigate the, the space so that you don't feel like you're being uh, mushed down or kind of controlled. You, you're able to use your 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 architect voice if you will uh, my husband has a teaching voice so i guess yes. the thing is the architect voice use your architect voice in a way that uh makes sure that people know that they aren't just going to get away with pushing you around do you think that you are a rule or an exception um well i do think that of the friends that I have that are in the profession there, I am um, on the stronger side in terms of, I had a lot of, I was part of, um, there are others that are as strong or stronger than me, no question in terms of feeling, you know, like they belong and they're a part of it. But I have had a lot of friends in the profession who have been really 
timid and um, it's too much. It feels too much. It's a hard profession. It's yeah. a demanding profession. Uh, it gets harder with family demands for sure. And um, I even see women uh, in this day and age that I want them to be a little stronger. I want them to speak up a little more or to push a little harder or make sure their voice is heard instead of hanging back. I'll see them wait and defer. Mm -hmm. And um, so if I, if it's appropriate and especially if only really if someone asked me, but if it's appropriate and I think I can challenge somebody to say, you know, you've got a lot of chops, you've got a lot to offer. Um, and it might be good to speak up and let somebody know that you're, you know, you have their best interest at heart and you, you have good ideas and might be good to share those. So I try to say that when possible, but, you know, you try to be careful and not overstep either because not everybody's ready and you never know what everybody's going through and that type of thing. Um, but I love to mentor and, and hang out with uh, young folks. I, I like to talk to a lot of men and women young people in college and even in elementary and junior middle school. <laughs> and uh, I, I can't believe how many young people are still amazed that I'm an architect. That's Absolutely. just blows their mind, right? Absolutely. I'm going to connect you with someone that sits on the Durham Public Schools Career and Technical Education, and you can uh, work with her. Uh, I, I think that would be wonderful to have, uh, you know, because we have a lot, we, like, we have IBM and all the big companies that are there, but we have very few small companies and they're not always looking for money. They're looking for people to mentor and, you know, kind of help these kids navigate what's, what's next for them. So I think that would be a great thing. Her name is Andrea Austin. I think she might've been on our call the other day, but if not, I will make sure I connect the two. Of yes, you. actually she and I were in our first breakout together. So I will apps. we did chat just briefly and I, and I shared with her that I would be interested in doing that. So thank you for that connection. Absolutely. That's my job. I connect people. That's what I do. I love so. it. So, um, but I, I still, my question still remains, you know, because I, what I heard you say, I hear very few women say that. Now, Georgie, uh, the other architect that I, I interviewed, uh, she had gotten to a place where she was strong enough to not allow her voice to be minimized or to be mis, misused, you know, but she had been in this field for a long time, you know, 20, 30 years, you know, um, she comes from an ethnic background, so she, you know, she had lots of things that would, would make it impossible for her to succeed, yet somehow she succeeded. And, and, I, and I turned the, calendar, the, the corner only to look back at myself, so I am still often the only person in the room. Uh, what I do, so information technology is one of those things where it is heavily white male, you know, and I mean, you know, the numbers are absolutely uh, disappointing and, 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 and shocking to see the number of black and brown women in leadership roles in IT. And I mean, I'm not just talking about you get some level under the CIO or something, but I mean, actually being the CIO or being the CEO or whatever a company is, it's not a lot. And so it, it is interesting to me that you have been able to do that, but I would ask, and you know, do you think that's because you're white? Do you think is that what's giving you that latitude? Or do you think it's just your personality, how you were raised, you know, going to state and all this? How do you how do you think you got that strength that you use to make sure your voice is heard? Well, I do I do not discount the fact that I'm white because I think that that makes everything easier, period. I mean, there's just no question about it. But I will tell you that my parents say that I was strong when I was born, that that when I was a little girl, it was hard for them to know how to handle me. And my dad said, I think if we can get through this, like power struggles or me wanting to be in charge and whatever, if we can get through this, it's going to benefit her in the long run. <laughs> it was just hard. My mom's a preschool teacher. So you talked about having using your voice. My mom has a preschool teacher voice. She's very gentle. She's very patient. She's the kind of person that turns the lights out to get everyone's attention. <laughs> and um, I am a, just a loud, boisterous bull in a china shop. And so that, I mean, we get along great, but it was really hard to parent me. I mean, she didn't know what to do with me. I also was just hard charging on all my goals and all my grades and everything that I did. I just went for it. And so um, I don't want to ever discount the fact that I had privilege. No question. I got, uh, I, I benefited from white privilege. But I also think that there is something about my personality from what my parents say that early on they saw in me that I was sort of a natural leader. 
Um, I also want to point out that I got a lot of gifts from Girl Scouts. I'm a big Girl Scout. Uh, I don't, are you a Girl Scout? I never did go to Girl Scout. I grew up extremely poor. And, you know, Girl Scouts wasn't a thing when I grew up. I grew up, I'm a baby boomer. So I grew up in a town where Girl Scouts didn't really get their legs. Unlike the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts didn't get their legs until many years later. Yeah, sure. Well, I was fortunate to find Girl Scouts when I turned 10 and we moved to North Carolina. It, it did, we didn't, I wasn't a part of it before then, but when I moved, it was the way that I met people and got to make friends and girls. I had a really strong leader and she pushed us incredibly hard. And I got a lot of leadership and business and entrepreneurial skills from her. She forced us to run meetings. She forced us to make budgets. I mean, she was she was a little bit intimidating on the one hand and she was a teacher um, and a storyteller and she was, you know, her heart was absolutely in the right place. And she did, she made all of us very strong. And so everybody from that Girl Scout troop, number one, we all got our gold award, which is the highest award in Girl Scouting. And number two, we all went on to do, you know, a lot of us have either PhDs or our own companies or professor, veterinarian, uh, ER doctor, just really high level degrees and high powered careers. And so I think that that was a testament to the leadership of our Girl Scout troop. Excellent. Straight up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you know, from the first time I talked to you, even to now, you know, you come across as that you do not come like not, not too many people are going to bully, bully you or you aren't going to take anybody just just talking anywhere anyway to you. I think the thing that's really interesting about that, though, is for for a lot of black and brown girls, having that voice, you get labeled, right? So you're angry, uh, you're an angry black woman, or you are passive aggressive, or you are straight out aggressive or something. So it would be interesting to hear as, as you and I continue to chat, and as you continue with your career to, to hear how you overcome those labels that are often assigned to women and, and, and to people of color in these instances of leadership. Yes, it is. It is interesting. It's a double standard for sure, certainly for all women and black and brown women even further. And I think that um, I've been labeled emotional, for sure. I've been labeled bossy, you know, as a kid. Now we know that that's, you know, not the way we should talk to kids, but that was early on. I think that um, there have been times where people think, uh, it, because I am frustrated about some situation on a job site or whatever, and I'm making a big issue out of it, um, you know, there's there's definitely, I feel like, a double standard about how I'm perceived or how I'm labeled. Um, but yes, even more so. So if there are women who are, are Black and brown, I am listening very closely to how they navigate waters mm -hmm. um, and listen to how they talk in meetings because I always think I have so much to learn and um, we all just have to continue to work so hard on those stereotypes and, you know, blowing them up. Um, and it's just not easy. And I feel like one of the tactics that I've been so impressed with with some of the women leaders that I've spent time with is uh, an ability to um, have facts yeah. <laughs> and just deal with the facts. Yeah, it's but, just the facts. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know if I told you this, but uh, one one of my dear friends, she is the in charge of security at uh, uh, American University and IT security specifically. And uh, when she talked to us uh, a few years ago, she introduced us to this word called hippie. She's a white woman, and so we had we had we we, we ruminated over that word for a while, and you know, trying to figure out what she meant by it because we just thought she didn't know how to say repeat. But uh, she said hippie. And uh, when she went to explain to us, she said that you could be sitting in a room with you know, your colleagues and you bring up an idea and it's crickets. But as soon as the man that's sitting to the right or left of you, you either use the exact same words or either rephrases it a little bit. It's like, oh, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. You know, where oh, we should have been thought of this, right? You know, so here she is, a white woman, a successfully successful white woman working in uh, IT security, which is probably one of the top uh, disciplines in IT right now, probably pays the most and all that because we're all being hacked at any given moment. Um, so, you know, that she too is challenged. She too finds herself having her words challenged. And um, and for me, you know, like, so most of my career, so I started out in a very 
beginnings as you know very very domestic kind of IT work and then it kind of you know went on I became a manager I've been a manager now for 30 plus years I don't even know how long it's a long time and a lot of it has been really challenging because white men are so resistant to being led by a woman and then you add a little bit of melanin to her skin it becomes a whole nother dynamic right so um I am just you know, thrilled to hear that you have succeeded in this way, but I would say in the IT space, we still have a long, long way to go. And I'll tell you one other thing about that. So being a white male dominated industry, you know, in 2015, Google came out with its first attempt at, at biometrics facial recognition software. And what does it do? The first two days it sees, it sees that melanin, it puts up a picture of a gorilla. Now, you know, as I tell people all the time, Google had no intention of doing that. You know, they're a good company. They have good business sense. But the problem is, is if you don't diversify your workforce, you're going to have outcomes that are not necessarily good for you and your organization. So I think that you should use your talents to make sure. I think you said you were working in school. I think you should. You should find ways to make your voice heard. I think right now is a difficult time to do that because we're doing virtual, you know, children are struggling with all the things they have to do virtually, you know, but I think that every chance you get, you should talk about, you know, what you have done and how you have overcome because that will become a lesson for a lot of people and a lot of people need to know that lesson. Thank you. I appreciate that. And yes, you're so correct. One of the things that I, you, you may touch on it as part of your questions, but one of the things that I love, and I'm, um, I'm reading um, Lead from the Outside right now, and I'm loving it. And she talks, Stacey Abrams talks a lot about self-doubt. Yep. And sh have you read this book? Yes, I have. I love it. And well, I should say Amazon read it to me. Oh, well, very good. Even better. <laughs> so you can do things with your hands while you're listening. Yes. Um, but she has a whole section on self-doubt. And I want to share that with several folks that I think could benefit hearing from it. And it reminded me of some times in my career where I did feel self-doubt. Yeah. And where I did think that it was part of being humble, as she says, and don't, not confusing the two. And when you, when you demure and and let somebody think that you don't know, basically, you know, that's all they have. That if you don't, if they don't believe it, um, they think you don't believe it, why should they believe it? So I really got a lot out of that chapter and it reminded me to double down on that. Yeah. I put a book in the, in the chat there. It says weapons of math destruction. Ooh. And it's, it's about the idea of why math does what it does but also that we as women are not smart mathematically, right? So there's something, you know, why would women, you know, be math gurus or right and things? And so she does this thing about big data and how much inequality there is and how it actually threatens how we live and work. And uh, so if you get a chance to read, it's not a long read, it's a small book, I know it'd be 125 pages, so I don't know if it's a small book, but it's a really, really good book. And I think every girl should, should have something like that as a, as a crush because, you know, what you touched on earlier, we don't often see people who look like us when we're starting out, right? So when you were becoming an, an architect, you know, in school, it wasn't like there were tons of women in there in the architectural uh, classroom, you know, telling you how they broke through and, and what you need to do to be successful, which is to me, one of the problems with education as a whole, right? So we go to school to learn this formal task, how to be disciplined, right? To go to school every day, do your homework, go to class, you know, do all the things, and then you come out you go to college and it's the same thing, discipline, discipline, discipline. But none of them, none of that actually teaches you how to do your job that you're going to do when you leave that building. You know, if the goal is to teach discipline, they get a bright red star with a gold thing beside it. Great. They did that. But the problem is, you know, like people in IT or other areas, what they teach us in school has no relevance to what we do in real life. Right. So, you know, there's computer science and there's information technology. And I think somehow in there, there should be a marrying of those two degrees so that there's the practical and the application. So you understand how that works, but that's just me uh, blathering on about nothing. I agree. I completely agree. Um, and, you know, I love all the work in STEM nowadays, especially for young people. And um, we need to, we need to continue to focus on it because I did, I got really scared of math. I wasn't bad at math, but I got afraid of it. And I let that dominate my psyche and become very, uh, very destructive to me. 
And it was only later in life when I realized it's not that I can't do it. It's not that I just, I had put up a mental block and I had decided that it was too risky. Um, I wanted people to like me. I didn't, you know, and it, it was a huge, huge blow to my self-esteem. And so I, uh, that's the other thing I tell young women all the time. Don't worry about math. <laughs> you can totally do it. And we have lots of tools now <laughs> that make it easier. And I wish I could learn computer science and coding. My son is learning coding. I'm like, wow, I wish I had an opportunity to learn this. So anyway, yeah. uh, but yes, it's the, it, there's so many uh, demons around um, being afraid of something or what society tells us we, we, we won't be good at or whatever. Um, and then sometimes we, we lose track or lose sight and it's sad. It really is. Uh, you know, I will say, you know, that I'm married to a very brilliant man. My husband is a third grade school teacher, which I don't even know what that means because I mean, you've got to be in a person, an amazing person to do that. I mean, third yes, grade, indeed. you know, and you're, you're being challenged every step of the way, you know, but somehow he does. And uh, it's amazing to see how kids respond to him. And I think that the, in, in this one instance, I think that and, and maybe that's a bit biased, or maybe I don't have the right to say that. But when I watch my husband teach, I see the impact he has across the entire classroom, yeah. not just with the black and brown kids, not just with the boys, but the entire classroom. And I think that that's what's missing in how we learn is having someone who is legitimately enthralled and engaged with us as yes. we learn, you yes. know, because, you know, it's easy to become, uh, you know, lost in, in, in education, you know, you, you, you got these big classes, you got one guidance counselor for each grade, you got all these things that, that stand out against them and then for them to make it, they need to have someone that exists for them. So I'm still advocating for you and I'm very proud of my husband. So it's just, you know, very, very good. So I'm, I'm, I'm definitely gonna connect you to Andre when I get off this chat. Awesome. Um, and, and, and then the, the, the last question I have, because I'm gonna leave some time so you can talk about what, what you may wanna talk about. But, but then my last question is this. So how does the future of architecture look with the technology? So with robotics and algorithms and artificial intelligence, what does the future of architecture look like to you? Yeah, well, the future of architecture is bright in a lot of ways because architects are tr always trying to think up creative ways for, you know, uh, solving the world's problems. Um, we still lack enough affordable housing, for example. Um, we're still struggling with energy consumption. And so there's just a lot of technological advances in materiality and in efficiencies around projects that I think are when, when I look at the magazines and, and read about what the young folks are doing, I'm always amazed. Um, in terms of what architecture looks like as people, it is beginning to change in the schools in terms of diversity and men and women. The problem is like everything, when you get up into the ownership level, you still don't have anywhere near I mean, like you talked about in IT, we don't have anywhere near enough owners um, and partners who are diverse. And so I, I've seen a lot of really great momentum with NOMA, mm -hmm. but also there's a new organization here in the Research Triangle that just started called Diversify Architecture. We just became a member. Um, I'm excited about my own staff. You know, I have uh, 30 people wow. and just literally from bubbling up from within grassroots, they decided they wanted to create a committee for racial justice in the workplace. Excellent. And they wanted to tackle issues head on hiring, uh, training, mentorship, what we read, how we talk to each other, microaggressions. I mean, we have covered so much already and they did that. You can't make people in an organization want to care or want to do that kind of work. It, it, they, they literally came from within. They formed the committee. They meet. I'm only allowed to come when I'm invited, mm -hmm. and which is great. And, um, you know, we have time on the timesheet that they can bill for that work. Mm -hmm. And we have activism days and volunteer hours that they can be paid for. And so um, it's coming. We got a lot of work to do. But I wish every architecture firm 
would take a look at these issues. And a lot of them are. A lot of them are very um, wanting to be more socially progressive, I think. But I think there's so much work to do with the older, more established, you know, kind of, you know, it's the young folks are going to help us. <laughs> That I, I really do. I see the future in the young folks, the energy and enthusiasm they bring. And if you if you hit a ceiling in a firm, you need to start your own firm. You just need to go out and do it. And we're seeing that more and more. And that excites me because there's there's just not enough diversity, period. Absolutely. Uh, so. And I think that's absolutely correct. So um, my, my, my last question, I promise this is my last question. So with technology, so... Um, you don't see that as a threat to architecture. You don't see that as a threat to the pencil and paper and graph paper to um, you know production of whatever it is you have designed. You don't see that uh, robots and, and other kinds of uh, advanced technologies would be a threat to that uh, space. I have not seen that. And hopefully that's not me being too naive. We use a lot of advanced sophisticated technology in our drawing programs that allow us to model the building in three dimensions and down to as much, I mean, more detail than you could ever want. And I think sometimes we struggle with how much detail we really need to put into it versus how much we need to wait and figure out in the field. Cause that's a whole nother thing. I would say where we need more advances in technology is in construction. Yeah. Um, and it's coming. There's some prefab, there's some interesting prefab advances that are helping that because it, Prefab can be really effective on speed and quality, you know? Uh, and so that's of interest to me too. But when you're doing something custom that's kind of unique, it's harder to get that. But, but architects that are working with um, how, they, how panels are manufactured and then clad the building in an interesting way, you can, you know, some architects are threatened by that lack of creativity that that affords. But I actually think the opposite is true. And those that are being successful in it, they're taking, they're understanding what can happen in the factory and what that can do with computers to benefit their design. And they're figuring out a way to allow that to afford them a more creative process that then also can be more exact, uh, more efficient, you know, less waste, yeah. um, better product because it's better quality when it's built in the, and then it goes up quicker when it shows up on site. So I get excited about all that stuff. But, you know, one of the things that, that, that's been, uh, you know, specifically in the housing market, you know, uh, you know, there's these houses are built in like days. Um, yeah. Not far from where we live, um, we saw once they got the land and was able to get all the trees and the overgrowth and all that stuff off of it. I mean, like the houses were showing up one a day. It's like, how is that possible? So is that uh, the digital nature of, of, of architecture or is it just at the products are more prefab and more, you know, post-constructed. So they're ready, you know, you're kind of like, you know, got a chain of events that happens to uh, allow you to uh, get these houses up in such timely fashions. Yeah, I think that is more of a testament to the prefab than to the design. Although the design is cookie cutter in, to some degree too, like a kit of parts, you know, I want this roof and I want this porch and I want this, you know. And so it kind of becomes more like a, an assembly line of a car, you know. Um, and so, I mean, that can work very well for a lot of, um, of speed of, uh, and need. Um, I think we need to do more of that on the affordable side. And there are architects that are very much championing that, which is a huge blessing for our industry and for our communities. Excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are all my questions. Um, before we go, I want you to meet Michelle so you and her can figure out how to, how to connect. Okay. Awesome. Uh, uh, so anything else you have to add or any, any things that we haven't touched based on? Well, you I was kind of curious about how this came about for you. Why did you start doing this and what, what prompted you to do this and how long have you been doing it? And because, you know, you and I just met last week and then I was so excited to get your message on LinkedIn and to be a part of this, but I was curious, how did you get started doing this? It happened right after Mr. Floyd died, um, was murdered, um, you know, I was, I, I, you know, I had never been a big news person because the news has so much junk in it that it's not necessarily helpful, but I was watching the news and hearing all these commentators come on and talk about, you know, his death and, you know, various things that they had. And it just struck me as how few 
everyday people get to tell their stories of diversity and how they interact with diversity. So I started these diversity chats. So uh, I wanted the everyday person, regardless of what area you worked in, to tell what it was like to be black, brown, white, orange, green, purple, whatever color you aspire to, whatever sexual orientation you aspire to, whatever you, you, however you define yourself, to tell these stories about what you've had to do to overcome and the fact that you have overcome, but you still face challenges. Yeah, That's for sure. I love it. I love it. And I love how available you're making yourself. I mean, this is a huge amount of time. I mean, I noticed how many different slots you had available. And I was like, this is one on one. She's really she's digging in. She's committed. Yeah, so good. now I have all these people that I want to send your way. <laughs> send them all. And then um, I, I suggest you also listen to my podcast. I will. My podcast, I'm so my podcast is relatively new. But it is the part of my organization that I think that is most valuable to me, because like, I think that in a lot of ways, you know, um, one, one of my, my podcasts is about managers versus leaders, right? And so this a simple term, managers tell, leaders ask. That's simply it all, all that it is, you know, so you, you encounter people every day in your life, they're either managers or leaders. Those people who start telling you what to do and how to do it and what to do, you know, you've got a manager. So I ask you, what do you think we should do this? You know, you've got a leader. So I love that. I love that. Thank you. I will listen and I will report back. I'm excited. Excellent. Wonderful. Well, tell, tell, listen to the channel. Tell people to subscribe. To subscribe. Listen to the chats. Tell people to subscribe. You subscribe. And once the video converts, I'll, I will connect you. So let me just see if I can find the shell. I'm going to turn the recording off. Okay. Hold on a second. Uh, and thank you again for doing this with me. Oh, thank you for asking. Excellent. My so pleasure. I'm going to connect you to the